first speaker this morning is Jock Matthews. He is a longtime friend, collaborator, and generous supporter of ADHD New Zealand. He's director of Rosalie Clinic in Green Lane, a psychologist and cognitive behavior therapist who specializes in the assessment and treatment of ADHD, anxiety, depression, and um, occupational stress, to name a few. Um, today he is going to help us understand some of the issues that lurk behind the surface of ADHD that can make it so complex. What's under the tip of the iceberg? So help me welcome John Matthews. And today I'm primarily going to be covering uh, the comorbidity, the things that occur at the same time. So many people are referred for assistance with ADHD and or they're referred for assistance with anxiety, depression or other issues. And what I think is really important is recognising that things can occur at the same time. Um, and it's really important to recognise that and to look at getting help. Um, ADHD doesn't travel alone, it's often comorbid with other issues. So, I use the iceberg analogy simply because it does describe what you're seeing at the top around ADHD, around here, and what you're also seeing is a whole bunch of issues that could also be flipped around if we we're putting that iceberg the other way around. Uh, because um, the clinical work I do with a team at the clinic, we often see people coming in with difficulties with sleep, or they come in with difficulties with learning, difficulties with a sense of self. Um, and what we often see then is, I'm wondering what may contribute to that as part of the assessment process. We often see uh, that there are comorbid conditions. Um, ADHD is, um, as you may know, um, it's, a, it's an issue that affects a number of areas of the brain, but particularly the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is instrumental in affecting a lot of what your brain does and how you manage your work. So I grabbed this because I thought it was quite an interesting, um, the iceberg analogy, quite an interesting kind of example of how ADHD can affect a number of things, the hyperactivity, impulsivity, and attention, but you're seeing a whole range of other issues that are related to ADHD. These slides are going to be made available, so you don't have to take notes. I think the video uh, will also be made available, so um, it just helps you focus on what we're up to here. Now, as you can see, um, as a rule, it, it's not the exception. 75%, that's three quarters of people dealing with ADHD, also meet the diagnostic criteria for another disorder. Now that is not insignificant, 75% and as you can see that's just one disorder. A third of people have two but the average or the mean is three disorders alongside ADHD. And that's not, a, that's not uncommon it's a, and a lot of people get upset by that but you say well no it kind of makes sense when ADHD has affected you for a long period of time you're probably going to get anxious or you might feel down and flat, or you may have difficulties with learning, or you may have difficulties with your social functioning, a range of things. That's not bad news, but it does need to be understood. Sometimes it's bad news, but it needs to be understood, and I think that's essentially what I'm gonna be talking about today. Some people may finish my lecture today feeling a bit flat. Hopefully you're not, hopefully you're more informed and you can actually effectively look at the things that contribute to what you're doing. Um, 
as I said, it's the rule rather than the exception with ADHD. So what else is involved? Because three quarters of people dealing with ADHD are also dealing with other, other issues. The most common of those are major depression, anxiety, personality disorders, learning difficulties, substance abuse, and impulse control difficulties. Now I could go into each of these for 20 minutes on their own, but because we've got 20 minutes to cover all of this area, um, it'll be a bit of a whistle stop to it, and I hope you then maybe use this as, as a basis to do some more research. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions here. Um, I'm going to be sitting at a desk through. I can give you my email address. If you want to request or look at any of this information, let me know. A picture tells a thousand words, and I thought it might be useful just seeing the complexity of kind of a DHD. Um, it does describe the, that correlation between a number of other uh, areas. And what may often happen is people go and get some help, as I said, with sleep, or they're having difficulties with reading, or they have problems with mood, depression, and or hypermania mania. And I think it's really important that whoever you see also considers the other issues that may be part of the presentation. The numbers, oh, it looks like my slide's been a bit mucked up there, but it was a bit tidier when I, when I sent it through. I'm sorry about the disorder. But what can happen is you get significant percentages of morbidity. Um, I'll, I'll come back to depression and anxiety later um, and cover uh, personality disorders or personality issues too. Um, when your brain is having difficulty with managing starting and stopping behaviours, it can have an effect on a number of different areas in your life. I mean, this talks about eating disorders because stopping and starting eating or uh, drug use or drug and alcohol, stopping and starting, um, it can affect your ability to concentrate, stopping and starting, reading, actions, uh, emotions. There are a whole range of things. So don't be, don't be surprised that you see a number of other issues. Um, the other issue that, that can occur is, is people with a history of mood disorder. So their mood is not just sadness, depression, but can also be quite elevated. They may go through hypomania or mania. Now it's not very, very common, but it's something worth thinking about. Um, I've had ongoing arguments with a number of psychiatrists through the years about the comorbidity of ADHD and depression and or bipolar affective disorder. And um, I think there's a, a lot more knowledge around that in the last, say, five years. But prior to that, I felt as though a number of psychiatrists would not necessarily look at the symptoms of ADHD. Unfortunately, they would be looking at what they saw as, as the major players. And I, I got quite annoyed with that, saying, I hope you understand the comorbidity kind of issues around the presentation of this. Um, ADHD usually... Oh, here we are. Um, there may be an earlier onset for depression with ADHD. You also see something called dysthymia. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have heard the word dysthymia before. Okay, great. Good, you're an informed group. But it is chronic low-grade blah. I mean, that's, that's how I describe it to a number of people. And it often does um, accompany ADHD where people are not severely depressed, but they are mildly chronically depressed because of the symptoms of ADHD and it has to be considered as part of treatment. If you ignore the comorbidities, if you ignore this list when you're looking at assessing and treating ADHD, unfortunately these issues can affect, adversely affect your ability to treat ADHD. Because um, when, when someone is depressed, as you may know, um, your energy, your motivation, your hopefulness, your instrumentality, your activity is often adversely affected. Um, so it is quite an interesting kind of thing to think about in terms of which comes first or which occurs at the same time and will one disorder adversely affect your ability to manage another. Okay? Um, I don't think there's a pyramid or hierarchy scheme, it's a matter of which is, which is affecting. Um, the, uh, I've actually, one of my other slides, covers off um, personality traits. 
These, these are the most common that often present early and may continue through to adult years. However, other cluster C personality traits like uh, borderline personality traits, um, narcissistic personality traits, histrionic personality traits also manifest. And people will often say they've just got a difficult personality. But when you've got difficulty stopping and starting behavior, thoughts, feelings, and the emotions around that are quite significantly pronounced. It's expected that your personality style will also be affected. So a lot of people feel as though I'm quite judgmental when I kind of list it to this. I'm not. I'm just saying, okay, guys, this is what we're dealing with. And when I work with people clinically, they often go, are you giving me a hard time? I go, no, no, I'm just trying to help you understand this. So I, I, I hope you know, all of you are understanding that as well. This is a diagram I found uh, probably about five or 10 years ago. And I think the area in the, in the middle, um, particularly when working with psychiatrists, is really, really important to understand. The question that most psychiatrists fail to ask when someone reports difficulties with their concentration is, how long have you had difficulties with your concentration? Because if you're depressed or you're going through a particularly difficult time now, it's really important to look at whether or not that's been a lifelong issue about concentration. Because ADHD may occur over time. But also the other issues, um, these will often uh, be seen by someone as looking at bipolar affective disorder as symptoms of bipolar. In fact, if you look at it from a different perspective, a comorbid condition in ADHD, you see similar issues. So I think it's really, really important that in advocating for yourself or family members or understanding this, that you look at, and I could do these diagrams for a number of the disorders I'm talking about, but I think it's really, really important to look at how you manage um, an understanding of these issues. Is that, is that kind of clear? Is that making sense to people? Okay, this is just an example um, of one that I thought might be worth looking at. This is uh, the Kessler research uh, from 2007, looking at comorbidity with ADHD. Uh, the potential for mood disorders is quite high. Um, Depression is comorbid with 30% of, of ADHD. Um, an earlier onset, um, if ADHD is part of the clinical picture, you get an earlier onset of mood, anxiety, and substance abuse disorders. So what you're seeing is the, the symptoms that are uh, occurring in and around ADHD does predispose or occur um, at, a, at an earlier age for people um, who develop mood disorders, anxiety, or substance abuse. Sorry, I didn't explain that very well. It does mean there is an earlier onset of these if ADHD is part of the clinical picture. That's what I meant to so. say. Um, so you see here it is a risk factor um, and one that should be considered very seriously. I'm, I've been having ongoing discussions with people in community mental health services around New Zealand because I work outside of that environment. I can talk to them and, and get into conflict with them in terms of educating them about the, the comorbidity of ADHD without getting you know, too upset because I get concerned that many people dealing with mental health issues, uh, the ADHD is ignored. And I'm not sure why, because the research is robust, uh, well understood, well researched, well treated disorder, but I get concerned that CMHCs are not doing all they can. And there are a number of reasons why, I might discuss that later, but this is probably not the venue for me to do that. So, um, and I think it's also really important to note that if ADHD is effectively treated, it leads to a lower uh, incidence or the development of mood, panic, and PTSD. A number of other disorders, but this research in particular uh, looked at, at remission and uh, treatment management in those, those conditions. This is interesting around addiction. And I'm covering a number of areas because 20 minutes is not a lot of time to cover, but I thought this might be interesting. Don't worry about the orange blob. Those are controlled, people who you're comparing these two groups with. And it's fascinating to see that addictions develop a lot more if someone has ADHD and they're not taking medication. Now, a number of people say, but is the medication, isn't that, isn't that a medication? I'm worried about that medication. It might be causing addictions. It may be 
because a number of medications used in ADHD are stimulants or medications that people may look at negatively. What we're finding, the research, particularly this is, this is from a, a Dutch study, without medication and with medication and people dealing with ADHD, addictions unfortunately are slightly higher if people don't take medication. What, what it shows is the onset and the development of substance abuse problems in people with ADHD. Look at the orange line. It occurs uh, more quickly and at a higher rate than people without ADHD. So this is the danger period of time, teens, early adult years, when you get a greater incidence of, of substance and alcohol abuse problems. CADS, Centre of Alcohol and Drug Services, should know this. They are working with people with a higher incidence of ADHD. They also work with a number of people with mental health issues. So when I talk about comorbidities, the coordination and discussion and communication across services needs to be more robust. Are you understanding what I'm saying there, guys? And I get concerned that, that mental health professionals or people working in educational settings, in health settings, um, are not talking to each other. Uh, alcohol and drug services are not talking to other services where uh, for example, antisocial personality disorders, you're talking about criminal justice services, so there needs to be a coordination and, and probably a working group that looks at comorbidity and its effect across a number of areas. Um, so this is interesting and, um, and something that is really important to, to look at. The longer you can delay alcohol and drug use in uh, people dealing with ADHD, probably the better, because what happens is at age 20, 22, through till about 30, um, for men, unfortunately men's brains develop slower than female brains on average, guys, so be careful of that. The longer you can delay the use of alcohol and drugs, the more regulation that can develop because it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. The longer you have to develop, the better your brain will be. But many people dealing with ADHD as adults also need to manage this well. This was uh, from the same group, the Dutch group. Um, medication treatment for ADHD does not increase substance abuse. Now, there are the odd exception to that, but, that, but as a rule, when you look at meta-analysis of the research, it shows that it does not increase the chance. In fact, it looks at protective benefits you get, particularly with stimulants um, used in treating ADHD, you get a decrease in substance abuse. Now this is something that groups like AA, um, alcohol and drug services should look at, seriously. And I hope they do. I hope they, they from, from the education that's around nowadays, particularly conferences like this, you get an improved kind of understanding of these symptoms. Um, and, and it really is not a difficult thing to do. It's not this is the problem, it's what are the friends that are hanging around with this disorder. So anxiety, depression, and all the others that I listed. Um, whenever I talk about depression, there's a, a bit of a dip in the mood in the room. Um, I remember talking to a group of nurses about 10 years ago, and I went through the symptoms of depression, and suddenly there was this kind of flat kind of feeling around the room. Um, if you are dealing with depression, then I'm trying to help you understand it. Um, I hope you, you're getting some treatment or you're looking at helping, but this is a common, this is a common cold of psychiatry depression, um, anxiety and ADHD. They're the most common um, of the ones I will be talking about today. We're not talking about just sadness. Sadness occurs, people struggle, um, setbacks, disappointments. That would more effectively be called grief and adjustment. We're talking about major depression which has an effect day to day, has an effect on work, uh, eating, um, study, sleep, um, but the other interesting thing about this is when you look at the symptoms and the listed symptoms, one of them is concentration problems. Now, as we know, in a number of these anger and irritability, um, loss of interest in day-to-day -day activities, a number of these might be explained in terms of ADHD, but an effective assessment of the differential diagnosis between depression and ADHD needs to consider the length of time concentration problems may have been there and vice versa, because you may have comorbid. Remember, 75% of people have both. Okay? 
on average, people have three. So a really important part of any differential diagnosis. And that's where I work with a team of people at Rosalie Clinic where we've got psychiatrists and psychologists and we brainstorm around what is causing what. Um, the assessment of these kind of issues is really important. Changes in thinking and behaviour occur in and around depression. Um, as you can see again, you've got some issues around making decisions, concentrating, thinking clearly, poor memory. These are issues that are comorbid with ADHD, but they're also issues that present in depression. Um, these are some risk factors. Now, unfortunately, um, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, or are they occurring at the same time? Many people dealing with ADHD find that they may lack some social support, they may have stressful life experiences because of the, um, because of the, the symptoms of ADHD. But these are also risk factors that predispose depression. Um, we could go into that, but I'm just conscious of time today. There is a link between anxiety and depression as a comorbid condition. Um, there is a biological vulnerability to that, as there is with ADHD. Um, and unfortunately, they're like bad friends that hang around together. They often, they often go together. So um, depression can make anxiety worse, and vice versa. If someone has an anxiety disorder, it does predispose them to more depression, for example. Panic disorder, social phobia, OCD, uh, acute adjustment disorder, PTSD, there are a number of anxiety disorders that do increase the likelihood that people are going to go through depression. Um, and I often sit there drawing big diagrams for people on pieces of paper looking at what causing what and arrows. And it looks pretty messy at the end of it all, but it actually starts to make sense going, ah, so it's not just this one, it's that one contributing to that. And they go, that's it. Ah, well, and they, they will sit thinking, okay, which, which one? is the one that I need to deal with now. And I say, well, let, let's start where we can and then look at dealing with the other bits as we go. Um, it's important to recognize, as I said, um, not just both conditions, anxiety and depression, but how they play with other issues. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have had anxiety at some stage in your life. I've had about three or four panic attacks. I haven't had one for the last 10 years, but panic attacks. I've also been through depression and that's not an enjoyable um, experience at all. It's, it's a very difficult disorder. Um, one of the things that is really important to look at here is how anxiety symptoms manifest. Um, trouble concentrating, as I mentioned earlier, irritability, restlessness. People may interpret the symptoms of anxiety as ADHD, and it's really important to look at how that may not be the case. Um, so there are very, very effective treatment strategies for anxiety, and understanding that you may be dealing with anxiety is an important part of your, of your uh, health management. Panic attacks, the symptoms um, that are very scary for many people that actually prevent them doing things, social situations, uh, exam situations, um, going somewhere where you may feel completely out of control and panicky. All of these are symptoms that are relatively well understood in terms of anxiety. So what do you do with coexisting conditions? I think it's really important that firstly you understand and manage them. Um, and if that means you sit down with a list saying, well, which of these affect me? Now if ADHD is part of the picture, then it's a matter of saying, what are the other issues that may affect me? And or, if I go through depression and have a comorbid ADHD, which of these symptoms affect me the most? And um, a piece of paper and a pen can be really useful doing that. Then you take that to whoever you're working with, whether it be a coach or a therapist, or a psychiatrist, or your GP or a family member or whatever, and work out how do I manage these various parts of the puzzle. Because if you just focus on treating one of them, unfortunately you're not going to do as well than treating all of them. Does that make sense? Sorry, I keep going on about this. It feels like I'm a broken record, but I, I think it is important. 
um, diagnostic challenges with your health professionals. Now, this is important. You are an informed kind of, you, know, you are involved in managing your health. Now, having that discussion with people around you who are helping is a vital part of the process. If that means you write down the discussion you're going to have so you don't get off track, and you photocopy it and give it to the person you're working with, saying, hi, this is what we're going to work on today. Well, this is what need, I need to be working on over the next month, two months, five years. What I think is really important is saying, I think I may also have anxiety and depression <coughs> and or I may have personality difficulties or I may have substance abuse problems or I also eat far too much chocolate in the evening. Okay? So, and those, those, are, those are part of the impulse control kind of it difficulty. So one of the really important things here is working with your health profession or people helping you understand this. And most of them should say, fantastic, you are well informed, we love this, thanks very much, keep working as hard as you're doing. And if you don't, if, if you're struggling with that, then ask them to give you a hand with that. I want you to help with issues around comorbidity. Um, and I think it's really important to discuss options for assessment and treatment, both publicly and privately. And I've, I've been gently given the community mental health services a hard time because there needs to be more understanding about ADHD, I think, in, in our health services in New Zealand. And I hope conferences like that kick that off. Many people um, are looking at initially getting help with anxiety or depression or, you know, and what really needs to be happening not only in private practice where I'm based, but I've worked in uh, community mental health services there's a need to understand conditions from a, a comorbid um, or occurring at the same time perspective as well. I think prompt treatment for ADHD and comorbid conditions is important um, simply because if you only if you've got a if you've got a stool and there are three um, legs on the stool and you're only kind of effectively managing one of them, the the the, the stool gets a bit wobbly. Okay, if, you, if you've got a whole bunch of issues causing problems, it's really important to look at, at looking at managing all of them. Medication can certainly play a useful role, um, not only with ADHD, but also anxiety and depression, mood disorder. As you saw, um, medication um, treatment for ADHD can also help with how people manage substance and alcohol abuse. However, many clinicians will not be considering using stimulant medication if someone has a substance and alcohol abuse history. So that's a problem that needs to be discussed clinically because people say, no, 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 we're not going to take it. The AA model says don't take drugs. But if you're seeing benefits for alcohol and drug services, what you will see is an improvement in someone's presentation. Um, so that's an interesting thing that needs to be kind of worked through. What you're doing here is continuously educating yourself and understanding what, what comes first, chicken or the egg, or the comorbidity of that. Um, and I also think the ADHD organisation and other organisations provide a fantastic kind of ongoing, informing, educating kind of role. Great resources. The ADHD uh, website um, is useful, but there are some fantastic websites online. Many of you may have seen them. Um, Cognitive behavioural therapy, um, assistance with um, looking at strategies to manage comorbid conditions is very, very effective. Um, the kind of approach in terms of um, support, uh, coaching, mentoring, or a whole bunch of things that can help people kind of manage these issues. The kind of treatments that are really useful, firstly, understanding. Psychoeducation is a really vital part of what you're dealing with. Educate yourself about comorbid diagnoses. And then educate the person you're working with, saying, I hadn't told you about this, I don't go out socially. Oh, why is that? Well, I'm too depressed or I get anxious because when I'm in a social situation, I can't control my thinking. And I get hyperactive and I don't make sense and that's a problem. And people go, ah, which of this is, is, is contributing the most? Individual psychotherapy and or in group situations can be very useful. Um, looking at strategies to manage the symptoms, cognitive behavioral therapy or skills building around planning, organizing. 
the planning and organization um, stuff, scaffolding um, yourself around managing the symptoms of ADHD is a really important part of um, getting to therapy sessions, organizing your day, sorting out the shopping, organizing calendars, using your smartphone to its maximum. All of these things are very, very useful things to be doing. They're often problematic because they require maintenance and attention and action, but these things can help you with issues around planning and organization. Um, other therapies that can be useful, um, marriage, couples counseling, coaching around a number of these issues can be really, really useful.